the start. And a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. You are with us again this month, August 2023, for Learn with Google, our monthly um, episode of uh, our, our, what do you call it, webinar that webinar. we webinar. talk about a different topic every month. Um, and we also catch you up on all the latest uh, updates and things that have come out with um, Google for Education since we last spoke on the 17th of July. So we've got a month's worth of updates for you. And there's some really good stuff there too. Uh, all right, um, moving on. So uh, just before we start, uh, I would just like to represent to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet today, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land and honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of this land. Um, you see all those lovely little drawings there from Noongala Creative of some of the countries around the Australian continent. And flipping over to the other side of the Tasman, I'll hand over to Steve. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, tihei moriora. Um, in the moment of whaki here, na wai tu kukiri, uh, ki te tūpun and tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, welcome everyone in. And I, I think it's been really nice to see during the, the Women's World Cup all the traditional names on the stadiums as well. Mm. Mm. Stadia. Yeah. Stadia? Yeah, Stadia. Yeah, no, that's been really lovely to see that. Uh, so thank you for that. Mm. Uh, and there is our team. And I, I think I mentioned last month that you know, it has grown a little bit with Darren and Harris both joining the team. But um, there's a whole lot of faces there that uh, you're always welcome to reach out to us if we can help in any way. And if we can, we will. Uh, all right. So today's agenda, pretty short and sweet, but lots to pack in. Um, we're going to talk about some design skills in Google Slides and drawings. And I guess, Steve, that'll be mainly me talking about that. But Feel free you to are, You are the design bureau, Chris. Point. You're um, that person that, that fixes things up for us and we make them they look a bit bung. Uh -huh. um, but then, of course, we'll do our usual what's new with Google uh, and we've got um, a whole bunch of updates to, to tell you about. Um, some we'll just skip through and some we'll actually do some live demos of and show you how they work. Uh, and as usual, if we get any time at the end, we'll have some questions for those who want to ask them. Um, if you'd like to, at any point, just add your thoughts into the chat. Um, Steve will be monitoring the chat. Um, and yeah, we'll take it as we go. All right, so I want to talk to you about some design skills in slides and drawings. And I will preface this by saying that um, I used to be a teacher of uh, design and multimedia and graphics and all that sort of stuff. So I've been a, a Photoshop tragic for a very long time, um, playing around in Photoshop and InDesign and Illustrator and all those sorts of um, uh, programs. Uh, it's kind of how I got into technology and computing in the first place many, many years ago. Uh, and what I've learned is that there are some skills that I felt I was taking for granted as a as a, as a Photoshop guy, um, just the way you interact with with design software. Um, and when uh, when I started using Google tools a lot more, um, what I found is a lot of the things I'd learned in tools like the Adobe Suite actually translated really nicely over into some of the Google stuff, particularly slides and drawings. And there's a lot of transferable skills that come across. So I have a little exercise for you guys today. And you are very welcome and encouraged to play along. Now, this is a this is a tool that I've used with many teachers in the past. Um, I've actually got some really nice feedback on this tool for uh, helping teach the skills of using the tools inside Google Slides. And because Google Slides and Google Drawings have so much in common, once you learn it in slides, you pretty much know it in drawings as well. Um, so we'll talk about some of the differences with that. But if you want to play along, go over to that address, bit.ly slash essential design. There is a QR code in the corner, although I don't quite know why I put that there, because you can only really open it on a phone, and that won't be very helpful. But um, you know, we do it because we can. So uh, bit.ly slash essential design. And when you go there, you'll end up with um, a uh, thank you, Steve. I think Steve's just showing it there. Uh, you'll end up on a slide deck, which is a slide deck designed to teach you how to use a slide deck. Um, and uh, it starts off, now, I've used this with a lot of teachers, and those teachers in turn have told me they've used it a lot with their kids. Uh, and I would encourage you, if you want to, to actually take some of these and actually use it with your students. Um, because what it does, you, you, can, you can give kids this deck and just let them loose on it and it'll I mean, as long as they can read i suppose um they can go through and they can teach themselves a whole lot of important skills so i'm going to do some of this with you today 
I will be going through this pretty quickly because I just want to show you some of the things that you can do um, with slides. Uh, feel free to play along. Um, if you've got a second screen, that'll be a lot easier than if you've only on one screen. Uh, otherwise, you can watch the recording later and, and play along. Uh, so there you go, bit.ly slash essential design. Uh, I am just going to come out of this uh, slide deck at the moment and go into... So here's what I'm going to do. So I see the same thing as you. I'm actually going to open the same link that you're opening. And um, hey, it'll I've actually open up in this view here. Sorry, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to quickly button. If you just hover yeah. over there, you know, little, little minimize window-y thing up in the top right there? This one, uh, that one. Next one up, yeah. What I've, I've just noticed that. You can oh, just yes. go over there and go split, split. So that's something I've found super useful. Mm. It is, um, and I, I guess we kind of borrowed that from another operating system that might have been doing that for a little while, but um, it, it's nice to have it here. Yeah. But yes, now now when you go to that sort of minimize, sorry, sorry the restore button there in a Chrome window, I'm on a Chromebook, of course, um, you, you get this option now to uh, to split the screen. So I can go to like mm. a partial screen or, or a full screen or whatever. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a nice touch. Mm. And if you want to, if you've got a big enough screen, you can sort of split it and do two things at once. Um, I just want to also point out that uh, if you click that link, you'll notice it opens in this mode where I've got a little blue button in the corner that says use a, use template. Uh, in case you don't know this trick, um, when you get the URL of a um, uh, any Google Doc, it normally ends in the word slash edit. If you take the word edit and change it to, you can change it to copy, and if you do that, when someone clicks the link, it will force them to make a copy. But it's I, I find it kind of nicer if you just say to someone, just add the words template slash preview on the end, and then it opens in this mode, and then they actually get a little template button. It just means they can look through it before they actually make a copy. If you go slash copy and they click that link, it just automatically makes a copy, and they haven't had a chance to actually see whether they want it or not. So there you go. So it might be a useful tip. So I'm going to click that use template button. It says, it's then going to convert my template into an actual workable slide deck. Uh, and so, yeah, you can use that trick if you'd like. Uh, all right, so I'm going to take you through, through a few things here. So this is Google Slides, obviously. Uh, one thing before we start, I just want to point out that all of our slides by default go to a 16 by 9 format. But if you go to the file menu and go down to where it says page setup, you'll see you do have some options here in terms of um, picking different formats that you might want to use. So um, widescreen, widescreen 1610, standard 4x3. But if you go to custom, you can actually type in whatever measurements you like there. So if you happen to know the size of an A4 page, which I believe is 21 by 29.7, I think it is. Um, but you can look that up if you're not sure. So you can put in whatever size you want there. I think that's an A4 page and hit apply. You'll turn this into an A4 page. Um, if you want to make business cards, you can measure the business card with a ruler and put those numbers in there. Um, we've used this to make pull-up banners. We've used these to make big posters. Like you can make anything at all inside Google Slides because you just specify the size of the canvas you want to work on and it just operates at that canvas size and all the design tools apply. So um, yeah, that's sometimes good to know and I will show you some examples in a moment of how you can use that in more of a desktop publishing mode. However, before you can do any of that fancy desktop publishing stuff or design interesting graphics and stuff, you, you kind of need to know a few basic skills. So I'm just going to work through some of the things here. So first of all, inside Google Slides, um, there is this little tool up in the corner here, which is to make shapes. Now, I'm sure you've seen it before. What I'm sure you have not done before is spend a lot of time looking at what shapes you've actually got. There is a ton of little shapes in here, and you can combine them in all sorts of interesting ways uh, to make other shapes, so compound shapes. So if I come up here, I, I can I can pull out, I can do a, a rectangle like that. I can come in here and I can choose a shape like a, I don't know, whatever that is, um, an L shape, right? So you can make those shapes, right? So that's the first thing. Second thing you need to know is um, there are a lot of shapes. So make sure when you come in here, like check out all of them because there's some really fancy, interesting ones in here you probably haven't really looked through here. Every time I say this to teachers, check what's in the shape collection, they are always surprised when they spend more than 30 seconds looking at it, at how many shapes are actually there. So do that. Second thing is um, perfect shapes. So again, this is something you learn if you're a Photoshop or Illustrator person straight away. And you, uh, you know, if you don't know this, you don't transfer it across here. But making perfect shapes 
if I go to the shapes menu again and I pick my rectangle again, but I hold down the shift key this time and do it, I get a perfect square. If I go to the uh, thing up here and I choose, uh, let's let's choose like the oval, right? I know it says a circle there, but like it just, it becomes an oval shape. But if I hold down the shift key, like so, it becomes a perfect circle. So if you want perfect shapes, that means hold down the shift key. Now that translates to things like if you want, for example, uh, to do a, like a line that's perfectly horizontal, hold down the shift key while you draw your line, right? You get a perfectly horizontal line. So anything where you want it to be perfect, hold down the shift key. Um, coloring shapes, uh, you probably work this one out, but if you click on a shape, you've got a little tool here for a bucket, which is the inside shape and the, the pencil, which is the outside shape. So you can make those shapes, okay? So that's, I guess most people know that. Changing the border styles, if you click on a shape, you'll notice that you've got uh, a line up here with all the different thicknesses. So I can make that really thick. Our little instructions on there say so make it a 16 point like that and then make it dotted or dashed. Well, that's this next button here where you can make it dotted or dashed. So all of those things are up there as well. And so you can get all the different effects if you like. Um, moving shapes, uh, again, as a Photoshop person, this is super obvious but I watch people work on computers all the time and I'm always astounded at how few people do this. If I want to move that shape, yes, I can pick it up and move it with my mouse. Of course I can. But I can also just grab it and go bump, 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 bump by clicking the left, right, up, down arrows and I can bump it around the page. Now, the thing is when you bump it around the page, it kind of moves in, I think it's 10 pixel increments. So it jumps 10 pixels at a time. If you want to slow that down so it's jumping one pixel at a time, Hold down our good friend, the shift key, right? And now every time I click it, it moves one pixel at a time. So you can bump things exactly in position if you want. Uh, now, when you go to aligning things, you'll notice this orange box here. If I grab the orange box and move it down the page, I get to a point where that red line appears. And I want you to notice that the red line goes all the way from the very left of the slide to the very right of the slide, okay? In other words, that's telling me that that red line that, that shape would be aligned to the center of the slide itself, okay? And again, if I move it this way, if I go this way instead, you'll see I get to a point where a vertical line appears. It should be somewhere there. There you go. Uh, that vertical line appears. That's telling me it's in the center of the slide that way, all right? And if, I, if I'm good enough to find both, uh, which is somewhere here. Uh, where are we? If I nudge that around a little bit, I can find both. There you go. So now I know it's exactly in the middle of the page. All right. So there's that. So there's the alignment of the page. Now, there's this other thing, alignment to other shapes. If I take the red box and I move the red box under the blue box, you'll notice that a red line appears. This time, the red line doesn't go from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. It goes from the top of the blue box to the bottom of the red box. That's telling me those two shapes are aligned with each other, not with the page, but with each other. Okay. And of course, I can take this one here and align it with that. I can take that one and align it with that. So I get a lot of control over the shapes with those alignment guides, okay? Um, and honestly, as a design person, nothing annoys me more than when I see people putting shapes on a page and they're kind of, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but they're like that. Like they don't exactly line up, like make them line up. <laughs> it really bothers people. Um, shape size guides, if I grab a shape and I drag it out to be longer, you'll notice it gets to a point where, see those two blue lines that appear underneath each shape? It's telling me they're the same length as each other. If I grab it this way and drag it upwards, it'll get to a point where it tells me they're the same height as each other. So if you want to make shapes that are the same size, you've got the size guides that appear automatically. Duplicating shapes, if you have a shape on a page and you want to duplicate it, um, this is what I see most people do. They go control C, control V, control C, control V, control C, control V, right? Control V, control Z, right? Undo it all. Experts do it this way. They hold down the control key. By the way, if you're on a Mac, it's an option key, right? But if you're on Windows or Chromebook, it's a control key. I'm going to hold down control while I drag that shape, I get a new shape. Hold down control, drag it, get a new shape. Hold down control, drag it, get a new shape, right? Don't do copy paste. It's just, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you wouldn't do that. Like it's just way faster to do it this way. And so, you know, so you can, you know, let's, let's make ourselves a friendly caterpillar, right? Um, a lot of people don't realize also that the text, if you want to put text on a shape, 
So uh, in our uh, in a previous life, I used to think called PowerPoint quite a bit. And in PowerPoint, generally speaking, if you want to put words on top of the shape, you create the shape, you create a text box with the words, you put the text box over the shape. In Google Slides, every object is a text box. So if I want to type the word stop into this stop sign, I double click it. And now I just type stop, right? Because the shape is the text box. You don't have to put a text box on top of the shape. It's just just works um, when you're creating more than one shape on a page you get what's called a stacking order so if you want to there are four shapes on this page you can see obviously the yellow square is at the back the the, the blue triangles in front of that the red hexagons in front of that and so on if I want to move one down I can click on it and then use the control arrow down or control arrow up and it will shuffle that object through the stack Right. So if I want to use, uh, want to move that yellow square to the front, I grab it and I go up, 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 and now it's at the front, and I'm changing the order of the stack. Now, pro tip: if you want to jump from one end of the stack to the other, from the very front to the very back, it's Control Shift down will take it all the way to the back. Control Shift up will bring it all the way to the front. Okay, so you don't have to go shuffle, 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 shuffle. Sometimes you can end up with hundreds of objects on your page and you want to just jump back and forth really quickly. That's how you do that. Uh, manual distribution of shapes. You can see that if I have a bunch of shapes here and I want to sort of move them around and sort of get them in order, what I can do is as I move them, you see I'm getting those guides that are appearing between them like that and it's telling me that the distance between those shapes is the same. So I can... I can do that with those gap guides, but you can also do it automatically. So for example, I've got in my menu up here, I've got an arrange menu, and one of the things is distribute. So if I select all my boxes by drawing a box around them, sorry, a marquee around them, I'll use the correct terminology. If you draw a box around an object to select it, that's referred to as a marquee, just for those of you playing along at home. Um, if I go to the Arrange menu now and say Distribute and distribute them horizontally, I get even gaps between them all. That Arrange menu is one of your best friends in Google Slides. It will really help you like make things look right. You also notice here that I have the ability to align them. So if I line them on their tops, they'll all jump up to the top and now I have those, those jumbled shapes all just become aligned and distributed evenly and it's a much nicer thing to look at. Sometimes when you create shapes, you'll notice that they have this little yellow diamond in the corner. And what that yellow diamond does is it tells you that there's something about that shape that is adjustable. So in the shape of this square with the rounded corners, that shape, that yellow diamond would let me change exactly how rounded the corners are. So I can, I can make them more or less rounded. In the case of this, I don't know what to call this, the no smoking sign, right? There's a little diamond there. I can click that and I can move that. It'll change the thickness of it. So I can adjust that. My smiley face here has one on his face. I grab that. I can make him a frowny instead of a smiley. This one here actually has one, two, three, four diamonds on it. And if you play around with this, you can say, well, I want that square to be bigger or I want these arrows to be taller or I'd like that gap to be longer, right? So you can... Whenever you see the little yellow diamonds, that's your reason to mess around with it, okay? Same thing here with this, this green square. We can change the, the dimensions of that 3D box. So you like control over the modifying shapes there. When you rotate a shape, if you click on a shape, you've got this little, it's like an antenna that sticks out the top. If you grab it by the little antenna, you can rotate that around and you'll see that I can twist it to any angle. You'll notice that it actually has the angle next to it. So if I want to put this as exactly 45 degrees, I can come up here and I can fiddle around with it. It gets to 45, right? But you know what? Remember our key, the perfect key that you hold down to make things perfect? If you hold down shift and do the same thing, it will jump in 15 degree increments. So if you want something to be exactly 90 degrees or 45 degrees or 180 degrees, like just hold down the shift key and that way it'll jump to the nearest thing. Same with our arrow here. If I want the arrow to face the other way, quickest way to face the other way is take an existing arrow, hold down shift, rotate it around till it's 180 degrees and now it's pointing the other way. All right? So little tricks that speed things up. When you group objects together, this is a Pac-Man if I want to make it one. So I can rotate my Pac-Man, hold down shift, rotate 45 degrees, take my black eye, put it in the right place for a Pac-Man, 
and now I can marquee around both those shapes and right click them and say group uh, group and now they act as one shape so if I pick, pick it up it won't uh, break apart and it also means if I reduce the size of it sorry I should have held down the shift key then shouldn't I because that would make it perfect um, I messed that up but you get the idea so it makes a pac-man by grouping shapes together now we talked a little bit about lines. There's a lines tool up here. Hold down the shift key to get a perfect line. Perfect that way. Perfect that way. There's also lines that have um, uh, arrows, connectors, curves, polylines. So if you want to draw a shape of something, you can click, 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 and back to the beginning, it'll make a shape. Um, polyline and the scribble tool. Uh, scribble tool is almost like having a freehand pen. So if I draw with a scribble tool, it'll turn it into just a scribbly mark. You can actually just draw with that scribble tool if you want to. I've got an example that I can show you. And there is a special kind of line called a connector. And what connectors do, if you look in here, there's an elbow connector and a curved connector. An elbow connector will join two shapes together. You notice that I've turned it on. I get those purple dots appearing. If I grab that purple dot and draw it onto that purple dot, and then let's do the same thing again. We'll connect that one to that one. The, what that actually does is it means now those they're connected and if I move them around if I grab that blue thing and move it the line stays connected right God the number of times I've seen people sort of stick there with a line and actually draw the lines and as soon as they move anything it's all broken again don't do that use connectors the uh, the curved connector by the way uh, same sort of thing if I join those two together like that you'll notice now I can move that around and it will stay connected with the curved connector. So that's that. Now, I've got a couple of exercises in here that you can do in your own time about combining some of these shapes. So like this is an exercise. Again, do it with your kids. Um, get them to, to combine all this stuff that they just learned to, you know, like, for example, make a Christmas tree, right? By, by using all of the skills we've just talked about, they can do that. I'm going to show you a really simple example about why knowing these skills can really speed up your workflow. Let's say someone asks you to make a chessboard. Right? So we've drawn a light colored square and a dark colored square. Right, We put them next to each other. Now, the quickest way to make a check chessboard that I can think of is to marquee over those, hold down my control key, because remember that makes it a copy, and shift at the same time, because that makes it perfect. And I'm going to grab those two things and drag them to the side like that. And then I'm going to marquee over them again, hold down control, hold down shift, drag them to the side again. Right Now I have that. Now I'm going to marquee all eight of them drag them down like that, but I need them alternating. Oh, sorry. Uh, I need them alternating, so I'm going to hold down that, hold down shift, rotate them around exactly 180 degrees. So now I have my checkers. Then I'll take again, hold down shift copy, drag that down, hold down shift copy, drag that down, and I've just made a chessboard. Perfect. Everything lines up. It was really super quick. Right, that's the way you can do this stuff. And then, of course, at the end, you would grab it all with a marquee, right-click on it and say group because you don't want it breaking apart now after all that. And what it now means is you can hold down shift to make a perfect chessboard at any size and it acts as a single object, right? Super easy once you know some of these simple uh, techniques. Um, I am not going to go through the rest of this because a lot of it is, um, we're, we're running out of time for a start, but just a couple of things that are important in here. I think um, this this is a thing that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, if you have some text and the text is sitting in a text box and you want the text to be the right size, the font to be the right size to fit that box exactly. Now, there is this, since I originally made this slide deck, Google Slides now has these little plus and minus buttons on either side of the font, which is nice. You can bump it up. But there is a keyboard shortcut for it. And once you get used to the keyboard shortcut, trust me, you never go back again. So if I wanted to select that text by click, triple clicking on it, I go, it is shift control on Windows or, or uh, shift command on a Mac. And then you use the left and right greater than, less than keys. So greater than, I want my text to be greater. I hit the greater than, bump, 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 bump. I keep going until it gets as big as it can get, and I'll probably go one too far. That's too far, so I'll go back one, and now that's the perfect size for that text box. Again, you don't want to be one of those people that sits around, is it, is it 17? Is it 18? Is it 21? That's no, too big. Like, just bump it up, right, manually, much easier. Um, when you're dealing with images, we've talked a lot so far about shapes. 
because they're easy to use. But all of the stuff you've just learned about shapes applies to images as well. So if I want this picture of Picasso to remain perfect, I hold down the shift key while I drag it and it remains perfectly undistorted. Let me undo that. If you want to crop an image, if you double click it, click, click, you'll notice it gets a black border around it. I now have two sets of handles, the blue ones and the black ones. If I grab it very carefully by the black ones, you'll notice that I can trim that down by grabbing the black handles there to put a box around it. And then when I press enter or click away from it, I get a cropped version of that. The nice thing about the cropping, it's non-destructive. That means that if I change my mind and I go, I need to crop this differently, I go click, click, and all of the stuff is there. I didn't actually get rid of it. I just kind of masked it away. Now that masking technique um, of cropping a shape actually works with shapes as well. So this picture of some roses, if I come up here to this cropping tool and right next to it, there's a little drop down arrow, you'll notice the drop down arrow shows me our friends, the shapes that we were working on before. And now I can pick any shape, like say a love heart and turn that into a heart. And so I've masked my picture in the shape of a shape. Uh, and of course, all the other things apply. So we talked before about like putting borders around things and changing the color of the border, uh, wherever that is uh, there. All right, so you can start to do some nice things. You've also, in the format options, got some other options in here as well. So things like drop shadows. So you can put a nice little drop shadow behind that. Maybe I'll make that sit a little bit further away like that. Oh, maybe we'll make it a little bit blurrier like that, All right? So there's some nice effects there. I'm just right in Photoshop. In, um, Photoshop. I'm right in Google Slides, but I'm using very Photoshop-like effects uh, right in here as well. Some, you know, I won't show you that one. Uh, flipping an image, if you've got an image and like this girl's facing the wrong way, it looks weird, she's sort of pointing off the slide there. You can take that and from the arrange menu, you can rotate that and flip her horizontally. Now she's pointing the other way. That looks more normal to me. She's pointing into the space on the slide, not away from the edge of the slide. Um, here's another little trick that really speeds up your workflow. Let's say you are, this is a picture of winter, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you realize that if you go to the insert menu image and you can insert an image onto a slide, I think we probably all know that. But a lot of people don't realize that if you click on a photo, there's an option to replace the image. So if I wanted to have winter, spring, summer, autumn here, rather than put them all in individually and then spend all that time making the boxes the same size, right? Let's just Let's show you how we did this and delete those three, right? So, so I have one picture. I use the techniques we've learned. Hold down the control key and the shift key. Drag that sideways. Now I have a copy. Grab, grab the two of them, hop, control and shift, drag them down. Now I have a copy. I have four copies of winter. But I want to take this one and say replace that image. I'm going to search the web. I'm going to replace for summer. And it's going to say, yeah, this one's nice. I'll do that and replace. And now it's going to replace my winter picture with a summer picture. And the point now, I don't have to fiddle around resizing boxes to make everything neat because I know they're the right size. Same thing there. We'll do that. So re replace the image, search the web, look for whatever this is, spring. Right. And that's a nice one. So we'll do that. Double click. And it goes in there and so on. So really easy to swap out images. If you're building a template for something and there's a lot of repetition, just build one bit and then duplicate that bit and then just replace the bits you need. Much faster than building everything from scratch. Um, uh, there is some reflection tools in here. If we looked in those format options before, you've got things like I can, I can add um, uh, like a reflection of the boat. I can go to the star and add a... I don't know, a drop shadow underneath it. I can go to the reflection down here and add a reflection under it. So there's, there's those sorts of tools. They're all built in as well. Uh, adding video, you got insert video up here. Obviously, you can insert things from YouTube or your Google Drive. You can add audio by going insert audio, which is here, and you can insert an audio file in there and play music or sound effects or a quote or someone speaking. Uh, as long as you've got the recording, you can just drop that onto the slide. Uh, diagrams is something a lot of people don't realize this is here. You can go insert diagram and there's all sorts of pre-made diagrams for you. So if you're trying to show the process of something, for example, there is a process diagram. 
and let's say your process has, I don't know, four steps. You can come up here and say, I want four steps and I want my color to be green because that matches my thing. And so uh, there's a good one. I like that. Oh, I did it twice. But you get the idea. So you can just drop those onto the slide and they're all pre-made for you. Now you just go and swap out your content. Um, uh, I am not going to do the rest because I'm conscious of time, but I just the last thing here is just builds. Please teach your kids how to do builds on slides because this is such an important skill when giving a presentation. So in this example, I want to use the animate tool to make the sun appear when clicked. I'll right click on the sun and say animate. Uh, there it is there. And so I want my sun to appear on a click. Done. Okay. Then I want my moon also, to, uh, I'll add an animation for the moon. I want my moon to fade in, right? And I want it to take 0.5 of a second. So I'm going to go down here and move this little slider to 0.5 of a second. That's great. I want my cloud to fade in after the moon. So I want the cloud to fade in after the moon. And I want it to take 0.8 of a second. 0.8. There you go. And finally, the lightning. All right, I want that to fly in from the left. Oops, sorry. Uh, lightning fly in from the left. Uh, do it after the cloud, so after the previous, and then take 1.3 seconds to do that. And so if I was to just play that now, you'd see what happens is, you know, I, I need one click for the sun. I need one click for the moon, and it fades in, and then the cloud fades in with the moon, and then the lightning fades in with the cloud, because that's how that's all set up. So you've actually got quite a bit of control over here, and you can automate a lot of things. And when you're trying to explain something, and let's face it, often you're using slides when you're trying to give a presentation to explain how something works, being able to animate that process of something, I do this, then this happens, and then this happens, like that animation process is a really key part of using slides to tell a story. So please make sure your kids are across the animation part of it. Uh, all right, so uh, that's, uh, I mean, we didn't do every single slide in there, but hopefully you got something out of some of that. Um, I'm just gonna go to this very last one and say, if you use these slides today, if you've been playing along, what you can do is reset them by going to the file menu and going back to, uh, where are you here, um, version history. And when you go into the version history, you can just reset all your slides to how they were before we started. So if I go back to how they looked at um, uh, 3.39 today, right, that I'll, and then restore that, then all of that stuff I did, I'm, I've just undone, so I can use these again fresh. And then if you want to make a new copy, you've got that file, make a copy up here, and you can make a copy of the entire presentation. And what I recommend you do is what I did with you today, give, give your kids a copy of the slides but force them to make a copy so that they have a fresh copy um, and that i think is hopefully useful for you um just to touch on a couple of things i mentioned desktop publishing before that you can change the shape of a slide by putting any dimensions you want in there so these are some examples of stuff I've, i used to run this workshop with teachers where we'd learn to do desktop publishing with slides uh, so instead of using something like, I don't know, Microsoft Publisher or Adobe InDesign or something, which can be you know, somewhat complicated and somewhat expensive, it's actually pretty easy to use slides to do publishing. And what you get with slides you don't get with, say, something like InDesign is it's collaborative, right? You can collaborate together on slides. So if I go into this, this is the sample pages I was showing you. So each of these uh, examples here have been just made by teachers that I've been working with. Um, where they've learnt to do desktop publishing in slides. But you can hit the share button up here so that people can collaborate together. Uh, and of course, you can go to the file menu and you can say download as a PDF if you need it as, as a PDF. Uh, if you want to present your work, you can hit the slideshow button and now it goes into slideshow mode. And now you are presenting the pages of your desktop publishing. So I think there's a lot of real wins to doing desktop publishing inside slides uh, that you actually don't get with other programs that are you know, built for that purpose. Some, sometimes the stuff you can do in here is actually uh, even better. So there's that. Um, 
And then finally, if you want to have a play with it, I've got two examples here of Google Drawings that use the same kind of skills that I've just been showing you of manipulating shapes and moving things around and aligning things and all that stuff uh, is you just build on that. So for example, these icons here for Google Workspace tools, like this is just a blue box. That's just a, a, a white square in the uh, triangle in the corner to block it off. These are just three white lines, right? And, and each, each of those shapes are actually just built using just shapes but you can recognize those as obviously the Google Drive icons. Um, if I go to this one for random drawings, things like the Australian flag, the New Zealand flag, the BMW logo, the Adobe logo, the Instagram logo, these have all just been made in Google Slides just by manipulating shapes, turning them at angles, laying them over the top of each other, aligning them, layering them, grouping them, all the same skills, but you can build all sorts of really interesting stuff if you just think about how shapes are designed. You know, if you look at this Australia Post one, for example, like it's it's a it's a rounded square with a white circle in the middle of it with a red half circle with a red line. Start to think about how shapes are broken down. It's actually a good exercise to get you kids, like randomly give them logos of companies and ask them to reproduce that inside slides or drawings. Uh, it's actually a great skill builder. Okay. All right, Steve. I have been talking a lot. My apologies. No, man, that was that was fantastic. I mean, it was there was so much stuff in there that is super super useful. And yeah, you've got a a huge range of skills. So no, no, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And, no and I, I I kind of felt like some of the things you were telling people not to do, you were directly pointing at me when I was doing that. <laughs> I wasn't, but it, it it is amazing. Just a few simple like simple skills that just build on and some of those keyboard shortcuts and by the way i will say this um i was working with some teachers recently and we were talking about how we work with really young students like year one year two students and particularly about how they use the trackpad on their computers right uh, and I, I heard one teacher sort of saying that she thought the best technique was to use two fingers like to use one finger to hold down the trackpad while the other finger moves around because kids at that age don't have the right dexterity. I would question that and say, I would always teach young kids, and this is what I did teach young kids, make an L with your hands like that, and then use your thumb to press and hold and your finger to move around and try and learn the skill of manipulating the trackpad with one hand, not two. The reason I'm a bit um, uh, bullish about that is because I know what happens later down the track in, in your development of being a computer user, yeah, two fingers might be okay to start with, but if you can't break that habit of two fingers and do it with one hand, then all of a sudden, when I say to you, hold down the control key, hold down the shift key, hold down, like, hold down control while you drag, you can't do that now because you've run out of fingers, right? And there is so much fundamental, um, like, advanced skill that you need by holding down keyboard modifiers as you do other things that if you get into the trap of not being able to work one-handed on the trackpad or the mouse, um, then you just, there's a lot of stuff you can't do later on when it starts to get more complicated. So I would just say that. Nice. Uh, right. Um, Steve, let's let's tag team a bit on this one. Yeah, man. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the things I went through the change log um, of, uh, there is a, there is, if you type in what's new with Google, or education, you can actually find the, um, the page. And Steve, you're always good at remembering what's the address of that one. The Workspace Updates blog. Workspace Updates blog, yeah. So I just go there and I filter it down to the last month and pull out the stuff. And so these are some of the things that have come out in the last uh, month that I think. Because we're getting back to back to school up in the, uh, with our North American friends, um, there, that's when, like, there's two kind of big, big times. There's the start of the year with, with BET. And then there is back to school for the US. And so we're getting up to back to school now where lots of stuff's coming out. So a lot of things coming out, a lot of things I'm really excited to see being published coming out as well. Absolutely. And for, well, Australian teachers at least, um, uh, there is um, uh, Edutech next week in Melbourne. So hopefully, if, if you guys are in Edutech, by the way, come and find us at the Google booth, come and say hi. Yeah. Uh, all right, so here are some things. Uh, uh, I've listed them there, but I'm just going to go through them. So line numbers in Google Docs, uh, it's a little thing, but I know a lot of people who have been asking for this for a long time. 
Um, you can now go into a Google Doc, and I've got one right here, and you can now go into the Tools menu and say Line Numbers, and you can turn on your line numbering. Um, and so you can either continue it throughout the document, restart it on every page, restart on every section. Um, but what it does, it puts a line number in front of everything. And, when and you're I think trying Chris, to even, even when you went to the Tools menu there, yeah. you know, the Tools menu in Docs has expanded dramatically over the last year. You know, It really has. Yes. Yeah. And I know we've tried to talk about a lot of this stuff as it's come out. I remember variables. We talked about them a couple of months ago. But if you haven't, if you miss that, like variables, it's super interesting about what it can do. Um, it's not in the tools menu, but I know that uh, one teacher I know in particular who was very keen to have this appear, this show non-printing characters, mm. you know, because when you turn that on, you can now see your line breaks, end of line breaks, spaces and so on. So, uh, I mean, Word has it. We didn't have it for a long time. Now we do. So that's, you know, it's nice to have that. But the line numbering just simply means that if, you know, if, if you and I are collaborating, we don't have to say, oh, it's the third paragraph down on page two. It's, you know, it's line 27. It's a lot yeah. easier to talk about it. Um, so that's the line numbering. Um, the next thing is. And this one is pretty big, man. A, this, this one. Is this one is big. Now, I do not have this active in this account that I'm using right now, so I can't demonstrate it to you. It's it starting to roll out today to um, to rapid release, and I think end of the week just to regular release. So by the end of next week, everyone should have this. Yeah, yeah. I've got it in my Google account at the moment, but I haven't got it in this demonstration account. But when it comes out, what will happen is when you are presenting your slides, so if I go into slideshow mode here, uh, and wouldn't it be fun if this just appeared magically in the last 10 minutes? <laughs> Probably. I think at yeah. the beginning. <laughs> it just means when you are presenting a slide and you go down to the little tag in the bottom corner under the three dots, oh, no, it's not there. Um, yeah. You'll get an extra option in here that says turn on pen, and you'll be able to actually write on your slides while they're in presentation mode. And, and does everyone know laser pointer? That's what I was saying. you're going to go laser pointer or just L gives you a laser pointer. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to do it with the keyboard shortcut. So I'm going to press L and you'll see my mouse now turns into a little laser pointer so I can point at things. Mm. Um, and, and, the other, and by the way, the keyboard shortcut for the pen is shift L. Mm. So um, same sort of thing. So if we go uh, L again, it'll turn that off. Okay. So that is um, adding annotations to slides. By the way, the little colored buttons up in the top corner, fundamental standard teaching and learning plus. So as I'm going through these features, the little buttons in the corner will tell you which editions of Workspace they belong in. Um, this one and the last one I just showed you uh, in every edition of Workspace. And uh, uh, the the this one, the annotations, is also in gmail.com. So even in is, your yeah. email, it's going to be in there. Yeah, it's going to be in the Gmail account as well, your free account. Um, this is an interesting one. I threw this in there. I don't know how many teachers this might be relevant to, but um, you know, the, there are probably teachers out there who do tutoring like after hours tutoring or something. Um, what this actually does, a couple of months ago, we released the um, appointment slots or appointment bookings inside mm -hmm. Google Calendar where you can designate a block of time and have people actually book into your calendar. Um, what we're adding to this now is the ability to connect this to a payment account such as Stripe and actually put a payment for um, a time slot. So for example, if you were tutoring and you wanted to sort of allow people to book in tutoring time with you, you could actually put a payment thing in here so people could pay when they make the booking. Um, so again, I don't know how many people that would be relevant to, but I thought it was interesting that that's there. I will point out that it is off by default in education accounts and the admin would need to turn it on specifically for that OU. Um, uh, if we got any, anyone on the call that uses Canvas, the learning management system Canvas, because here is a, uh, a, a nice little integration of Google Docs or Google Drive, Google Workspace, uh, inside Canvas. Um, we have a tool called uh, Google Assignments, which is kind of like a cut down version of Google Classroom. So it's basically just the assignment managing part of Google Classroom. Uh, and that's now available uh, with a, a new integration that works really nicely inside Canvas. So if your school is not a Google Classroom school, you use Canvas, and there's a lot of schools that really love Canvas, uh, but you still want to use Google Docs and stuff for your assignments, uh, you can now integrate that directly into Canvas with this new um, integration tool. 
Uh, Chris, I know that's a, that's something that a lot of universities are using. So they use, use uh, Canvas, and this allows them to use all the Google stuff in the background of Canvas and get yep. all of the beauty of the of the integrations of, of Docs and Drive inside of Canvas. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, this is available in all the editions. Um, this is a cool one. I really like this. Uh, this. If you've ever been in this situation where you are trying to negotiate a time with someone, like should we meet on a Tuesday? Are you free at seven? Are you free at nine o'clock on Tuesday morning? No. What about what about three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon? No. And you go back and forth trying to negotiate a time. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate how this works because I think this is really neat. If I come out here and go into my Gmail, okay, um, and you should have this live now. Uh, I think. Is, is this for everybody? I just forget. Um, so, uh, yes, it is. It's for everybody. Okay. So uh, let's say I, I compose a new email and I'm trying to negotiate a time when I can meet. So uh, I come down here. You notice you've got this little button down here now that looks a little bit like a calendar. And when I click on that, it opens up. Um, I can either offer times that I'm free or just create an event. Because I don't know when the other person's free, I better just offer some time so I'm free. So I do that. This panel opens on the side here with my calendar. So let's say I'm available for some meetings tomorrow on Friday. I've got a little bit of time between 12 and 3 that someone could book in there. And I can come down here. I can fine tune that into whether I want to offer an hour or a half an hour or whatever. Um, and that's fine. And I've also got some time next Tuesday as well. So I'm going to go over here to next Tuesday and say, you know, I've got a little bit of time between 9 and 11 on Tuesday morning, okay? So now you see it's blocked out those times here on my calendar, and then I say next, and it generates this list here, and then I say add to email, and what it does is it drops all that directly into my email with those buttons, so when I send this email to someone, they can go, oh, well, those are when Chris is free, I'm gonna book into that one, and then that drops its time into both our calendars and creates a meeting. I think that's a really nice thing. If you work in a Google Workspace school, you know you can probably see everyone's calendar anyway because that's kind of how the collaborations work. But this is great for when you're dealing with someone who's not in your domain or maybe not even a Google user. Um, they can do that as well. So yeah, so that's that's I thought that was a really nice one. And that looks really familiar, really familiar for people who are using the um, the booking slots, the new exactly. updated booking slots. So it's the same sort of deal. Um, it's yep. a great way to, to let people pick a time that's good for you. Yeah, same technology. Uh, in Google Meet, which we're using right now, there is a Q&A module. Um, and uh, I won't actually do it right now, but it's a, it's a small but important change. Uh, in the Q&A module, uh, you could have people asking questions on the fly during a meeting. Um, you can now moderate those questions. It just mm -hmm. means if you, if you flick a switch in the settings, uh, you can then decide whether uh, those questions get proofread by someone before they go live or not. And as we all know, working with children, sometimes if you let them put anything into a live forum, they will. And it's not always a great idea. So it's nice to be yeah. able to moderate that. Uh, and it also works for uh, anonymous mode as well. So even if people are putting anonymous questions in, you can still moderate those questions. Uh, this one's coming. I have not seen this working yet, but it is coming soon. In fact, you can sign up for the beta if your school would like to be part of this. It is for plus users only, so uh, you do need to be a plus school for this. But we are currently testing uh, e-signatures in Google Docs. So you know when you someone sends you a, uh, like a document, you've got to sign it and return it, and that horrible process where they ask you to print it out and sign it and scan it and. Uh, so you'll be able to do that all directly inside Google Docs. Um, and it's not currently available for everybody, but if you are interested, there is a link to sign up for the beta um, by scanning that code. Uh, and we will make all of these slides available to you at the end of the meeting as well. So all of the links in here you'll, you'll have. So that's e-signatures. And then um, a couple of things in Classroom that I think are really neat. Uh, this has been, Steve, I know we've yeah. been here a long time, and so have I. People wanting to disable a submission for a due date in Google Classroom after the due date. This will be available to all editions, so everyone will get this. Let me show you how this works. If I go into my classroom here and I go into uh, create an assignment, say in Google Classroom, um, and I call this, you know, sample task, whatever it might be called. When I create a due date for this, so let's say I make this due next week. Um, when I, as soon as I create a due date, I get this checkbox now to say close submissions after due date. 
So up until this point, um, you've always been able to put a due date on classroom assignments, but kids have still been able to submit it after the due date. Sometimes you want to allow that, sometimes you don't. If you feel like being a bit strict, there is a checkbox now to close that off so they can't submit after the due date. So hey, that Chris, I, I also got a clarification on this that it will, uh, when it rolls out, that it will stop the take back ability as well. So once yeah. the due date hits, there's no take backs and there's no late hand ins. Nice, nice. That's and that's oh, okay, that's awesome. Yeah, so for the for those of you who are in the senior school, I, was, I used to be a secondary school teacher. Um, if you're using this for an assess an official assessment, um, mm -hmm. there is now no take backs, there's no late hand in, so it's perfect. It basically stops it at the point when you see the hand in timers. And I noticed that also another little update to it used to be when you set a hand in time, it, it defaulted to 11.59 p.m. If you notice now, that time's gone. So the default time of midnight has now gone for the hand in oh, time. Okay. I didn't notice that. Okay. Yeah, and it's a really nice, it's a really simple thing, but people, you know, setting hand-in times at 11.59, not great. Hmm, <laughs> true. True, true. Uh, the other thing in Classroom that we just announced is in practice sets. Now, we've talked about practice sets a few times in the past. Um, practice sets uses artificial intelligence to suggest um, additional uh, resources for students. Um, in, if you're using the teaching and learning or the um, uh, plus edition of Workspace, which is where practice sets is available, uh, there is a new feature in there now where you can vet the suggested materials. So you can actually see what it's suggesting. Uh, it, it, in the past, it wasn't that easy to actually see what was being suggested. And you can also do your own. So if you are Mr. Eddie Wu, for example, and you want to direct kids to your video, or there's something great on um, Khan Academy or something you want to use some specific thing that you like or your own videos right you can you can direct kids to whatever you want so just again to show you that real quickly if I go into my practice sets here by the way did you notice in Google classroom there's been a little redesign here uh, these these mm -hmm. buttons along the top here they used to be in the middle and we've moved them to the side but it also means we've moved some of these other buttons over here as well including this one where the settings are and this one, which we haven't really released officially, but it's kind of, we've announced it, it's class analytics, where you can click on that button and get analytics for your classroom. So you'll be able to see some, some relatively basic uh, stats about, you know, which students have handed stuff in and, and how, lo how long ago. And this is a demonstration account here, so none of these are real students. But Chris, uh, one, so. of the, one of the amazing updates there is that third column across. So the grade, the average, average grade. grade. So grades weren't originally in the um, oh, okay. in the product. Now they are. Right. Okay. Cool. That's good to know. Uh, the other thing is good to know, and I know this is again something a few teachers have asked for, and that is, um, what if you don't want to grade with one, two, three, four, five? What if you don't want to give a numeric grade? You want to give an eight E grade or a whatever you want? Um, that ability is also coming to classroom as well, uh, where you can sort of use whatever grade system you like. Especially important uh, for New Zealand teachers who use standards-based assessment. So we have a, a letter grading. So NAME, uh, we can now put that in there as the grades. Yep, same here, same here. Um, uh, was I showing you the in-practice sets? Hmm. So I'll give you a real, real simple, quick example, if I can load it up. And that's really great for, I mean, to, I remember when we first demoed practice sets, people said, what about my massive collection of resources I made? Can't I port them to those? And, and we had to say no. The only way you could do was to drop the URL onto your question to yeah. kind of hack it around. Now you can. You can point it to your own stuff yeah. or local stuff, you know. So Australian educators can point to Australian resources. As you should. Um, uh, so question here, what is the perimeter of a square with three metre sides? And the answer is 12, obviously. But it, the AI has suggested some resources here. And previously, I didn't know what they were. So now I can click this drop down here and I actually see which resources are being suggested. And you can have up to three resources for, now a resource is like a hint. So if a kid gets stuck and asks for help by clicking the little light bulb, um, these are the resources it presents. Now, if, if a kid watches a resource or, or doesn't watch a resource, they just look at it um, and then they put the wrong answer in there, then when they click the light bulb again, the next resource will come up. So it can have three stages of sort of 
help edges. <laughs> Is that a word? Um, and if you don't like the order of that, you can click on this and change the order so you can move the order around if you need to. Uh, there is a little thing here. You can add a further resource. If there's a specific YouTube video you want to point to, there's a link there. If there's a specific hint you want to give, you know, um, uh, perimeter means the outside border, right? You want to just give a hint. You can save that and add that in there. And like that'll be the first hint that pops up. So there's some really nice things that are that, that are coming here now in terms of just being able to do that. I, I know we've always talked about this as being AI driven, and ideally it would be great if the AI was smart enough to just continually give it the right resources. But we also know this is kind of you know not a perfect world, and sometimes you want to be able to override that and put whatever you want in there, and you now have the ability to do that. So I think that's a nice update. And then the final one in here is shareable class templates. This is huge. Uh, if you just oh, go back to classroom here and I'll just get back to my class. So I've got this demonstration class here, for example, right? If I go to my classwork page. So let's say this was a, a, a course that had been developed and there was a whole bunch of stuff in here and there was resources all built and it was, and you wanted to reuse it or you wanted to share it with another teacher so they didn't have to build it all from scratch. There is a button at the top now that says share classwork. And when you click that button, you have the option to turn on this link to allow this class to be shareable and you get a copy code. So then when you copy that code, you can then email that to another teacher. When they click on it, now they do need to be in your domain at this point, right? So I'm still looking forward to the day where we can do this out of domain and teachers can share between, you know, between different domains. Uh, at the moment, this is all in domain. But it just means that if you want to give a course that you've developed to another teacher in your school, uh, you can now do that really easily. Um, there is a little option here to preview the link. So this is what the other teacher would see when they click on it. They'd get something that looks like this. They have a checkbox at the top there, which they can tick. And they can, if they don't want to take everything, they can just tick the bits they want. And when they do that and they say export that classwork, it will recreate this class inside, like for them. Uh, and they'll be the teacher of that new class. Mm. So I think that's a really big one. Uh, and that brings us to the end. And there's, there's 429. So our timing is perfect again, Steve. <laughs> it's good they didn't talk so much this time, Chris. <laughs> um so yeah just uh, remember we do these things every month uh next time we're looking at some self-marking quizzes in october we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into practice sets and we'll sort of really dig around through in there and then finally in november we'll do some digital portfolio stuff so please uh join us for those if you can if you can't the uh, re replays are always available in fact um we're putting all of the replays on a youtube channel um, so you can go back and catch them there if you like. Or if you just go back to the page where you, like the web page for these webinars, they're all being archived there as well. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to get access to all the stuff. Um, and if you would like a PD certificate for attending today, uh, then if you head over to bit.ly slash GFE certificate, fill in that form and uh, our good friend Autocrat will generate a certificate for you and send it straight back to you. All right. And on that note, uh, we will wrap up. If you are in the South Australian Directorate or, um, uh, or sorry, Department, uh, Victorian Department or the New South Wales Department, there's some contact links there if you want to reach out to any of your uh, people there, if you want to clarify any of this. Because often the stuff we talk about in these sessions, um, you know, it, it relies on it being turned on by various domains. So if it's not operating in your school or system, uh, you might want to just check to make sure that um, you know you can get it turned on. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop the recorder. Um, Steve and I, well, I will. Hopefully, you can too, Steve. Just hang around for a few minutes in case yep. anyone has any questions. And um, we and will hope you're through, yeah, you if you're at Edutech, as Chris said, come up and see us. Well, we've got I think three rooms. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, on the floor, and we've got two rooms upstairs. So you come see us. Quite a big presence at Edutech this year. I think we're like a platinum sponsor or something. We've got. I don't know, we're doing a lot. That might be a wrong term, but all right. <laughs> okay, stopping the recording.